for you to participate or let people know how to participate in the ministry for South Africa. Uh, for those of you that are watching this morning, uh, you can go to our website at sawdustroad.org and you can go to the give section in our website and it stipulates South Africa. You can give to our South African ministry. We've got two missionary trips going out. Uh, we support the ministry in that area. So you can be a part of that. If you want to know more about South Africa, please don't hesitate to contact me uh, directly. All right, here we go. You ready? We're going to talk about pride. We're going to talk about repentance. We're going to talk about unrepentance. What? I've never heard of anybody being unrepentant. But yes, we're going to talk about it. Now, here we go. You ready? When Lorenzo de Medi Medici, Medici, yeah, there you go. When Lorenzo de Medici, uh, dictator of Florence, lay dying, he sent for the noted priest reformer Guillermo Savonarola. Savonarola. You know, you never thought a Jew from New York could actually go there, but I'm there. All right? So, sire, said Savonarola, standing by the bedside of the dying tyrant, God is good. God is merciful, but for his forgiveness. Three things on your part are necessary. Well, what are they, whispered Lorenzo. Well, you must have a sure and lively faith in the mercy of God. Well, I have that, said Lorenzo. And then uh, Savonarola, you, you, you must, says this, he said, you must restore all your ill-gotten wealth, or at least charge your sons to restore it in your name. And the dictator hesitated, but reluctantly he nodded in the affirmation in the affirmative. And finally, you must restore the liberties of Florence. And with this, Lorenzo bristled his eyes, flashing with anger, and he turned his face to the wall as if to say he would rather go to hell than do that. Pride. Pride. I'm not giving that up. No way. That's mine. Unrepentance. Listen to this. If there is no repentance, there can be no pardon. Okay? Some years ago, a murderer was sentenced to death. And the murderer's brother, to whom the state was deeply indebted for former services, besought the governor of the state for his brother's pardon. And the pardon was granted. And then uh, the man visited his brother with the, with the pardon in his pocket. What would you do, he said to him, if you received a pardon? The first thing I would do, he answered, is to track down the judge who sentenced me and murder him. And the next thing I would do is to track down the chief witness and murder him. So the brother rose and left the prison with the pardon in his pocket. You know, we go through life, um, and, and I say this, it, it, so involved in our own wants and desires that we do not follow God's perfect plan. It's a problem. And we're all guilty of it. We've got a mindset of what we want to do. Here's your question this morning. What or who is your modern day idol? You know, we, we come to church and we worship, right? W worship is not just uh, listening uh, to somebody get up in the pulpit and preach. Worshiping begins when you get up in the morning and you start praising the Lord. Worshiping begins when you're combing your hair, you're thinking to yourself, how might I do the work of God? Worshiping comes when you walk into this church, into this hallowed ground, this place that you revere 
God himself and you listen to the worship music and you worship in such a way that God is transforming your heart in the middle of that process so that when that whoever it is gets in the pulpit, you have prepared your hearts in such a way that you're ready to really worship that you're ready to hear what God has for you specifically. If you don't do that every day, if you come here on Sunday and you're hanging out and you're not really worshiping, whatever the person in the pulpit says, it's irrelevant. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, this is where we're going as we discuss this idea of the American Idol. That's our sermon title this morning, the American, you know, American Idol. Right? It's real big right now because American Idol's on television. I haven't watched any of it. Um, I get a kick out of some of these kids who come off the streets and you're like, where did that gift come from? Uh, just, just thinking. Right? So what I'm going to ask you to do this morning is to open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 40. We are going to cover chapters 40 all the way through chapter 45. It's a lot of text. I understand that. We're going to read bits and pieces of it. I'm going to survey, just so that you know, here's what, how it's going to kind of look. I'm going to survey chapters 40 through 43. We're going to dig in to chapter 44, and then I'm going to conclude with the survey of chapter 45, just to kind of put things in perspective um, for you. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to investigate, right? So we'll survey. I've said all of that. Uh, here, here's my thing. Idols have been an issue since the beginning of time. Idols have been an issue since the beginning of time. We could go back to Adam and Eve, right? Well, they had their idol. Their idols cost them the fall of all of mankind, right? So uh, we, we know that idols uh, have been uh, an issue since the beginning of time. And today's sermon, American Idol. Because we live in this incredible country. For how much longer, I'm not sure. Based on what's going on in our electoral system today, yeah, I'm going to say it from the pulpit. So you can chastise me or not chastise me. But the fact of the matter is, this is the greatest country in the world to live in. And if we allow it to go by way of socialism and communism, we will not be having the opportunity to be in this place to worship God. They will take it all away from us. And we must stand firm, we must go out, and we must vote. You must vote your conscience. You must vote who you are in Christ. Vote. Do not say somebody else will vote for me. Go out and vote. Okay. I'm done. Here's background. I can only imagine the, the emails I'm going to get on that puppy. But that's good. I want people to know it. Okay. Um, here, here's where we're at. In chapter 43, you know, we saw all this thi these things that happened to, Je uh, to Jeremiah. He was in prison. He was put in the cistern. And, and, um, and they, they lift him out. That the, the, um, um, the eunuch kind of protects him, uh, Ebed uh, uh, Melech. And, um, and so in chapter 43, God ends by telling Jeremiah to speak a word into the life of, of um, uh, Ebed Melech because of his faithfulness. Listen to what it says in verse 18 of chapter 43. I'm just cl cleaning this up. For I will certainly rescue you, and you will not fall by the sword, but you will have your own life as booty because you have trusted in me, declares the Lord. Folks, if you trust in the Lord, he will protect you. Absolutely 100% ironclad. I don't care what anybody wants to tell you. That is the truth. Yesterday morning, uh, uh, we had a memorial service here for my friend Bill who passed on. Strong believer. Several of the people that were here stood up and talked about the fact that they did not have assurance in where it was that they were going. That only by, by what Bill himself had preached to them and witnessed to them. My whole sermon yesterday uh, was literally out of Romans 8 that nothing can separate you from the love of God. 
You must worship the only true God. And no matter what you're going through, nothing, nothing can possibly separate you from that. I'm sorry, you know, it's funny. I'm sitting here and I'm reading and I'm looking and I'm reading and I'm looking. It was chapter 39, that uh, verse 18, that we were talking about God speaking. I apologize for that. I'm, I'm looking at my notes and I'm excited this morning, obviously. And uh, anyway, so let's take a look at it. Our first uh, point uh, this morning is, is called the survey. And why? Well, because we're going to survey chapters 40 through uh, 43. Uh, and uh, as we look at chapters 40 uh, through uh, 42 specifically right now, what's going on? Well, we see that the word in verse 1, the word which came uh, to Jeremiah from the Lord after uh, uh, Nebuzaradan, a captain of the bodyguard, had released him from Ramah when he had taken, into, uh, taken him bound in chains among all the exiles of Jerusalem and Judah, also were being exiled uh, to Babylon. Jeremiah is set free. He's set free. And he is given a choice. You could stay here or you could go uh, to Mitzvah, uh, to Gedalia. Gedalia was the new uh, uh, governor uh, that had been put in place, and he's a good guy. And um, so, uh, in verse 4, uh, we, we read that, uh, but now... Behold, I am freeing you today from the chains which are on your hands. If you would prefer to come with me to Babylon, come along and I will look after you. But if you would prefer not to come, uh, to come with me uh, to Babylon, never mind. Look, the whole land is before you. Go wherever it is, uh, wherever it seems good and right for you to go. His freedom has been given to him. This is uh, the, the chosen uh, voice of the Lord, the prophet Jeremiah. He's able to go back out amongst uh, his uh, people. And so the Babylonians had released, released Jeremiah from prison and appoint this governor, uh, governor Gedaliah, uh, over Judah uh, in Mitzvah. And so it, when you go down, Jeremiah went to Mitzvah in verse 6. Jeremiah went to Mitzvah, to Gedaliah, the son of uh, uh, Hikam, and uh, stayed with him among the people who were left in the land. And there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen here. And it kind of just drills in because we, we got um, really thick skulls, most of us. And for whatever reason, we don't allow uh, anything to penetrate that. Uh, you think about football players, right? You know, we got such thick skulls, but they still got to they, they gotta protect their heads. And they put more gear on so that nothing could penetrate. I feel sometimes that's how we walk around in life. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to listen to anything. It's, the head's too thick. Nothing's penetrating that puppy. If you scroll down to verse 8, so they came to Gedalia at, at, at Mitzvah along with Ishmael. Remember Ishmael. Remember his name, Okay the son of uh, uh, Nethaniah, Nethaniah and Johanan and, uh, and Jonathan, the sons of Korea, and Sariah, uh, the son of uh, Tanhumeth, Tan, Tan, Tan I'm sorry, and the sons of Ephi, uh, the uh, Netophite, and uh, Jezaniah, the son of uh, Machathite, uh, both they are uh, and their men. So all these people come down to Gedaliah. Then Gedaliah, in verse 9, the son of uh, Hakim, Hakam, uh, the son of uh, Sh- uh, Shaphan, swore to them and to their men, saying, Do not be afraid of serving the Chaldeans. Stay in the land and serve the king of Babylon, that it may go well with you. What does Gedaliah say? He says, listen, don't fight anymore. Surrender. Give it up. Right? This guy, Gedaliah, is a good guy. But there's one guy in the group, Ishmael. There's a problem. What are you talking about? 
You, you, you can't be telling us. We've been fighting. We can't take this famine. We can't take this pestilence anymore. We're all dying by the sword. There's like a small group of us left. What are you telling us to do? And that's kind of where he, he knew, uh, just like we should, when we should stay where God tells us to stay. Instead of trying to work things out on your own, work things through with God's direction. We hear all the time, all the time, God helps those who help themselves, right? I can't tell you how many times people say, hey, listen, God helps those who help themselves. No. God helps those who obey his word and work in the will that is in their life that God has placed on them. That's who God is helping. Why? Because you're not doing it on you. He doesn't want you doing it on you. And the whole point of being a believer in Christ is that you, were, that you literally surrender all of yourself to all of him. You might not like that statement. Those watching might not like that statement. But those are the facts. That is what God calls us to do. And so uh, we go through this whole process. We see that Gedalia is really trying... You know, Gedalia was, um, uh, uh, really, he was a good guy. Uh, in verse 11, likewise also all the Jews who were in Moab and among the sons of Ammon and uh, in Edom and who were uh, in all the other countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of, for Judah and that he had appointed over them Gedalia the son and so on. And then all the Jews returned from all the places. So as they heard about the remnant, all the Jews who had been scattered all over the place, they back, come back and they, they converge. Right? And so then all the Jews returned from all the places to which they had been driven away and came to the land of Judah, to Gedaliah at Mitzpah, and gathered in wine and summer fruit in great abundance. They were glad they could go back. And Gedaliah was committed to keeping the Jews together. There was, however, a plot against him. How many times in your life has somebody come to you and said, you shouldn't do that? How, how many times has somebody come to you and I say, hey, you know something? We're, we're friends. I've got to let you know, th this person does not have your best interests at heart. Right? As men, because I am a man, the last time I checked, um, I, I want you to know that uh, we have to keep one another accountable. Men have a tendency to stray. And it is very hard for men, because of our makeup, to have somebody else tell us not to do something. Tell me what to do. I got it under control. Okay? That's pride. That's being unrepentant. All the things that we just talked about. But they go to Gedaliah. Jeremiah goes to Gedaliah, right? But Gedaliah, the son of uh, uh, Hakim, Hakam, said to Jehanan, the son of Korea, do not do this thing for you are telling a lie about Ishmael. He comes to him, he says, listen, Ishmael wants you done. He wants you out. Don't be silly. Gedalia is this really nice guy. Everybody is lovey-dovey. We're going to take care of it. It's all going to be good. We're living in a world today. Stop listening to people that tell you everything's going to be great. You don't have to pay uh, for uh, medical insurance. Don't worry about it. Um, you, you know, we're going to raise uh, the minimum wage to $15 an hour. But tax is going to be at 52%. And when you do the math, Okay, that means you're really making about $7.20 an hour, $288 a week. Tell me about that burn, Bernie. Okay, so in any event, I'm sorry. I, I apologize for that, but and, and it has nothing to do with what, how I'm voting. I'm just telling you, you've got to go out and vote. You need to vote. So Gedalia doesn't, he doesn't listen. It's a problem, right? And so uh, as we walk through all of that, we get to this point. Jeremiah warns them uh, in, in chapter 20, uh, 42, 
I'm sorry, chapter uh, 41, uh, Gedaliah is murdered. Ishmael, the son of Nath uh, Nathaniah, uh, the son of so-and-so, and goes on, along with ten men, came to Mitzpah, to Gedaliah, the son of uh, Hakam, uh, uh, and while they were eating bread together there in Mitzpah, Ishmael, the son of Nath uh, Nathaniah, and the ten men who were with him, arose and struck down Gedaliah the son, and, uh, 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 and so on, uh, with the sword, and put to death the one whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the land. Sometimes you've got to listen to your brother. I'm just telling you. Or to your sister. Who, who God is put in your life for a reason. And you might need to kind of step back for a second and understand that um, it's a good word. It's okay. Listen. Gedalia just didn't want to, he didn't want to hear it. And, uh, and so all of that happened. Now, it happened on the next day after the killing of Gedalia, when no one knew about it, that 80 men came from uh, Shechem, um, from Shiloh, and from Samaria with their heads shaved off, their clothes torn, and their bodies gashed, having grain offerings and incense in their hands to bring to the house of the Lord. Then Ishmael the son went out uh, from Mitzvah uh, to meet them, weeping as he went. As he met them, he said to them, Come to Gedaliah the son of um, Hakam, And yet it turned out that as soon as they came inside the city, Ishmael, the son of uh, Nethaniah, and the men that were with him, slaughtered them and cast them into the cistern. And what Ishmael does is horrific. He's just not a good guy. And as we're looking through this, I want you to start painting this picture of, of this movement um, the, the Babylon is defeating. Jeremiah has been preaching for 40 years that if you would just do what the Lord is telling you to do, these things won't happen. They've burned down Jerusalem. Judah is in disarray. The northern, uh, the northern uh, part uh, of the nation of Israel is in disarray. We're, they're all in in exile. Things are horrible. And all these people could think about is, can I get a little something to, to eat? And if somebody offers them a, a crumb, they're quick to turn their back and go wherever it is that they um, want to go. And that's not what God uh, is, is telling us to do. And then Ishmael took captive all the remnant, in verse 10 of chapter 41, took took captive of all the remnant of the people uh, who were in Mitzvah, the king's daughters, and all the people uh, who were left in Mitzvah, whom uh, uh, Nebuzaradan, uh, the captain of the bodyguard, had uh, put under the charge of Gedaliah, the son of uh, Hakam. Uh, thus Ishmael, the son of uh, Nethaniah, took them captive and proceeded to cross over the sons of Ammon. And then Johanan rescue, rescues, rescues the people. It's, it's not a pretty, it's just not a pretty sight. In any way, shape, or form. We get to chapter 22. All of this is happening. The people are not being responsive or are they listening to what God had been telling them? They're just defiant. I don't know how else to say it. They're being defiant. No different than we are today. The, the divisiveness that is taking place in our country today is indicative of us not being obedient to God. That's what it is. We want politicians to, you know, um, Ben Carson said this, I posted, you know, we want politicians to fix our problems. If anybody would realize, it's the politicians who have gotten us into these problems to begin with. And government can't 
fix, you know, the Democrat, all right. Um, we, we have to be reliant upon God. We cannot be reliant upon men. My whole point in this is not to get into a political conversation. My point in this is that the political unrest that was taking place within this time, the time that Jeremiah was preaching, okay, God's prophet was preaching to them what to do. They became reliant upon other men in order to save them instead of looking to the Lord, listening to the word of God, and moving in the direction that God told them to move. And so it's, it's frustrating. And in, verse, in chapter 22, Jeremiah again, through God's direction, warns the people not to go into Egypt. Don't flee. But they don't want to fight anymore. They don't want the, 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 um, uh, um, uh, they don't want the hunger. They don't want the pestilence. They don't want the fight. They don't want the famine. They, they, they want some rest. God never said that we were to rest. He said, do the work that I tell you to do until I call you home. Right? I mean, if you, if you go just kind of quickly to, uh, Philippians 1, 6, right? What does it say in Philippians 1, 6? It says, for I am confident this, of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. It is not about, oh, I did my thing. I, I, you know, I put in my two hours at the church. I'm good to go. No, God is calling us every day, every minute of every day, 365 days a year to be a conduit for him as he calls you to be. And here, the, the, the people are begging Jeremiah, please go to the, to the Lord your God and ask and pray for us. What should we do? He says, what should we do? And, um, and, and so then Jeremiah in, in verse 4 of chapter 40, in chapter 42, then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard you. Behold, I am going to pray for, uh, to the Lord your God in accordance with your words, and I will tell you the whole message which the Lord will answer. And so 10 days go by, Jeremiah comes back and he says, this is what the Lord God has said, don't go to Egypt. Don't go. Stay here. And I will save you, but you've got to stay here. What do they do? They go to Egypt. Yeah, I'm not listening to that nonsense. I'm not staying here. You know? We hear that all the time. Oh, if, 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 uh, again, I'm going politics. I'm sorry. But if this person, whoever that is, is to win, then I'm leaving this country. How many people have run off? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the only type of, of medical system that works is a government. Everybody gets it. Um, you know, just look at Canada. It's wonderful. Compared, right? Whenever somebody in Canada has, something, has a problem, where do they go? They come here to the United States to get the procedures done. Why? Because we have the best medical system in the world. Why? Because it's privatized, not because the government is running it. Okay, I, I, you know. Um, I have signs, you can put them in your uh, yard. Um, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, now, at the end of the ten days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and he said to them, thus says the Lord in verse 9 of chapter 42, uh, uh, the Lord God of Israel, to whom you sent, this, uh, sent me to present, if you will indeed stay in this land, then I will build you up. He tells them, I'm going to get you. Okay, everything's going to be great. Nah. Nah. He's going to have compassion on them. He's going to do all these things. Nah, not so much. And so they, they, they're just living in their own little private Idaho, literally. We, we are destined to be disobedient, defiant, unyielding to God unless we believe in him. Listen, 
We must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one that we can believe in. There is nobody else. There are no other idols. As, as you read through these chapters, you will see how the wives of these men continue to burn incense, continue to sacrifice to idols, the God of the sun, and this and that. And what happens? Nothing. And, and what happens? They sit there and they say, oh, well, when we're worshiping those gods, everything seems to be okay. Okay, but when we're worshiping the, the Lord God, the creator of all things, it isn't so hot. God never said it was going to be a rose garden. He didn't promise us. Who sang that? You know, I never promised you a rose garden. He didn't. Jesus talked about it. He said, in your life, you're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulations. But be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. Right? This is, this is real, folks. We're not playing games anymore. We're at the, this spot. I mentioned Wednesday night. I think it was Wednesday night. I mentioned it. Um, Dr. Robert Jeffress uh, from First Baptist Dallas uh, was the keynote speaker at um, uh, Kevin Brady's um, uh, uh, prayer breakfast, Faith Leaders Prayer Breakfast. And he said, you've got to kind of envision it like an explosion when somebody blows up a building. And they come in and they put all of the, the, the uh, dynamite and C4 and all this other stuff in strategic structural places. And you set it off and you have a moment of pause waiting for the building to implode. The bomb has been set. We are in that moment of pause in our lives today. And unless we tell people about Jesus, it's going to implode. It's going to implode anyway, but we might as well get as many people as we can to know the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ so that they follow in what God says that at the moment that you pass from this life on, you are in the presence of the Lord. That's what we need to do. Chapter 43. In Egypt, Jeremiah warns of judgment. But the people's sin, I don't know what else to say, the people's sin, they go to Egypt even though God says no. And then in verses 8 through 13, Jeremiah gets a sign. He says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, Take some uh, large stones in your hands and hide them in the mortar. And he goes on, he puts these two stones on. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and absolutely decimate Egypt. So they ran away from where they were, where God told them to stay, thinking, well, there's food and everything is easy in Egypt. They, they forget that they were in prison and sla enslaved for 400 years, and God pulled them out of that. Don't, don't worry about that. How quick our memory goes. Kyle and I were talking yesterday. He goes, uh, Pastor, uh, we had that conversation. I go, no, we didn't. He goes, yes, we did. And I'm starting to think, you know, that I'm losing it. Don't say it. Not a word. Not a finger. Nothing. Um, in any event. All right, let's get to where we're supposed to be. That's what's happening, right? Chapter 44. Idol. American Idol. So chapter 44, uh, listen, just a reminder. Here's the reminder, chapter 44, verses 1 through 14, right? Jeremiah preaches uh, uh, the conquest of Egypt. And he pretty much says it's foolish to disobey. Every one of us is guilty of it, right? And yet we go home to our houses and, and how blessed we really are. How incredible it is that we have a God, we serve a God who sacrificially gave us the opportunity for everlasting life. Man, that's unbelievable. I, I wake up every day in amazement thinking, me? Yeah, he did it for me. He did it for all of us. But man, that's pretty cool. Right? And so he goes on and he talks about this, that Jeremiah preaches conquest. In verses 1 through 3, what you see is that uh, you have seen the bad things brought in uh, uh, Jerusalem. 
He goes, you already saw what happened. It's going to happen again. You never should have left. And then he goes on and he says, listen, um, <laughs> really for us, I'll, I'll use Harvey or I'll use the tax floods or you can use uh, the Memorial Day floods, right? M Memorial Day floods come. Man, that, that can, that's never going to happen again, right? It's the same thing. They're, they're in Egypt and he's going, and they're going to Jeremiah, look, that can't possibly happen again. And oh, wait a second. The tax floods come and it did happen. Well, there's no way that it could happen a third time. And 18 months later, what? Harvey, it happened again. Don't think that it can't happen because it already has happened. And so we need to be um, cognizant. We need to be uh, personal about the way that we listen to the Word of God. Because it's right here. He, he's not telling us something we don't know. It, it, it's happened. It, it, it's real. And, and so in, in verses 4 through 10, he says, I sent you my servants, but you did not listen. You just did not listen. And I don't know how much or how much more frustrated you could just be from that. And he tells them. He gives them a reminder. You know, he kind of, uh, um, any of you watch television and a show uh, is uh, on a weekly basis. I know a lot of people don't watch regular TV anymore. But sometimes the following week, what they do is they kind of recap for you. Just to, so you can remember. That's exactly what Jeremiah was doing. He's giving them a recap. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? This is what happened. This is how it happened. So on and so forth. And if you would just listen and do this, none of that will occur again. In your own lives, in your families, and everything, man, you gotta, you, that's what you got to go for. He tells them, you will not see Judah because of their sinful ways, because of their disobedience, because of all of those things. Our third point. Oh. I won't, and you can't make me. I won't, and you can't make me. How many of us have children that have said that to us uh, countless times? Ruby, Ruby Roo, you don't say that to mommy and daddy, do you? No, of course not. I won't, and you can't make me. You're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me. Jeremiah, I don't answer to you. Right? Well, who do you answer to? Because I'm speaking on behalf of the Lord God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So who are you listening to? And so in, in, in this third point, it covers verses 15 through 30. He says, I hear what you say, but I'm not going to listen. Verses 15 through 19. What did we talk about earlier? It was literally utter defiance. In verse 17, uh, you know, uh, he says, but rather we will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven. What? After all of this, they turn around, defiantly look at Jeremiah, now nah, we're better off, go ahead, and let's burn the incense uh, to the queen. What queen? The queen of heaven? What? What are you talking about? And pouring out drink offerings to her, just as we ourselves, uh, our forefathers, our kings, and our princes did in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. They, they sit there and say, well, we did it in Judah, we did it in Jerusalem, and look what happened. And they're, they're blinded to that. You know why they're blinded to that? I'm going to say it. His name is Satan. Satan def de defiantly looks at them and says, you don't have to listen to God. And that's why when we tell people, you, you, you are a bad person, right? We were born bad. There's no way to get around it. 
Our lineage is such that that's who we are. And the only thing that will take us out of that darkness and into the light is the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he went to the cross and he died for every single one of us. He rose on the third day. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He is our intercessor. He is the high priest. He is the one who took every single one of our past, present, and future sins upon that cross so that we might live forevermore. That is my God. Anybody interested? I'm happy about it. I know I, sometimes I don't sound like I'm happy about it, but I'm pretty excited about what it, what it did, uh, what he's done. And so when we uh, don't uh, uh, idol worship, uh, bad things happen is what they say. And when we uh, uh, worship the idols, everything seems to be good. Th- that is the deception of Satan. That is the one who says, nah, it's not so bad. Go ahead and do it. What's one look? What's a dollar? You think they're going to miss it? What's a pen? What's a paper clip? Who cares? Who really, in the scheme of life, does anybody really care? That's the voice of Satan and his demons telling you to be what? Defiant to what God has called us to do. Listen to the Word of God. In verses... In verses 20 through 23, the problem that there was is that they were not worshiping the right deity. They had multiple gods, but there's only one God, capital G. That's it. And that's the problem as we look at verses 20 through 23. So the Lord, uh, so the Lord was no longer able to endure it because of the evil of your deeds, because of the abominations which uh, you have committed. Thus your land has become a ruin, an object of horror and a curse without an inhabitant as it is this day. Hear those words because that's what's happening today. It's happening all over the world. There is great defiance and everybody wants to worship the idol that they want to worship and somehow that's going to make it when God has proven time after time after time that he is the only one that we worship. We are to love our God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and power, and strength. And that is the first and most important commandment as Jesus shared with us. And he said the second is to love one another as you would love yourself. And so he goes on. And in verses 24 through 25, again, we see this this continuance of uh, defiance. Uh, and, um, and then if we continue to scoff at God, he will repay us in a bad way, verses 26 through 28. Nevertheless, nevertheless, in verse 26, the word of the Lord, all Judah who are living in the land of Egypt, behold, I have sworn by my great name, God is speaking, says the Lord, never shall my name be invoked again by the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, as the Lord God lives. They had been so defiant, he's going to take their ability to call upon his name. If you're here today or you're watching, listen, turn, humble yourself. Confess your sin and call upon the name of Jesus and you will be saved and your eternity will be secure. And at that point, nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Verses 29 through 30. A sign of punishment. All this stuff is coming down. Now you're not going to be able to leave Egypt. Now you're not going to be able to leave. This will be the sign to you, declares the Lord, that I am going to punish you in this place so that you may know that my words will surely stand against you for harm. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am going to give over Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, to the hand of his enemies, to the hand of those who seek his life, just as I gave over Zedekiah, king of Judah, to the hand of, the ne- of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, 
who was his enemy and was seeking his life. Remember what Zedekiah did. If he would have listened to Jeremiah, he would have lived. But instead, what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He poked his eyes out after he, he killed his sons right in front of him. God says, listen to me. That's what he tells us to do. Why do I end in, ver- in chapter 45 as we, as we are, are going to conclude? And this chapter, if you're reading along, you will understand <clears throat> this chapter chronologically does not fit where it was placed. And yet I think that God has a purpose for everything. We're talking about the evils of idol worship. We're talking about this idea that there is only one God. We're talking about this idea that if we would worship him and listen to him, there are great blessings that will be before us, after us, with us, in all kinds of wonder, whether it's in this, on this side of heaven or on the other side of heaven, it doesn't matter. God's promise never, ever wavers. And so in his infinite wisdom, in the canonization of this uh, 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 Bible, and the way that they look to putting Jeremiah together as a book, they take a section chronologically out of place, should be back in like chapter, thir- after like 36, 35 or 36, and he talks about the obedience of Baruch. And here's what he says. Listening pays off. Our final point. Listening pays off. Baruch is upset. He he is, right? And so he's moaning. And he says, this is the message which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written down these words in a book at Jeremiah's dictation in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, a king. Remember, he brought the scrolls to Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim did, what did he do? He burned them! It broke Baruch's heart. It broke his heart. But God. Right? But God. And he goes on and he says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, Baruch. You said, Ah, woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning and have found no rest. He was upset about Jehoiakim burning the scrolls. But wait, my God says he will never leave us nor forsake us. The trials and tribulations, all of us experience it. I mean, it's right, it's life. Listen to what he says. I, I, I said it like this in my notes. I said, God gives Baruch a hug. You know? Just kind of wraps his arms around and says, hey man, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. It, listen to this in, 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 um, in verse uh, 4 and 5. Thus you are to say to him, this, uh, thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I am about to tear down. And what I have planted, I am about to uproot. That is the, that is the whole land. Verse 5 closes out this chapter. But you, are you seeking great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for behold, I am going to bring disaster on all flesh, declares the Lord. But... I will give your life to you as booty in all the places where you may go. If we are obedient to the one and only living God, there is nothing for us to fear. There is nothing for us to be afraid of. The only thing we could be assured of is that God is going to give us a hug. He's going to wrap his arms, protect him, protect us in such a way that we never even thought possible. I know that, that you're here and you've got life. And I know that things are going on in, in, in that life. And you're trying to answer those questions. Man, how am I ever going to get to the other side? I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I don't understand 
why God is doing this to me? Those are all the questions that we suffer with. Whether it's health issues, whether it's monetary issues, whether it's who knows what. God says, if you would be obedient to me through all the trial and tribulation, he says, I will give your life to you as booty, as a, as a prize in all the places where you may go. He promises that. And his promise never, ever wavers. And as, as, I, as I close, and, and, and Russ and Jack will come up and We can continue to refuse God's message to us. Or we can listen. I mean, that's really your choice. I I can't do that for you. I can simply share what God is telling us in the Word that says, hey, if you would listen to me, everything's going to be okay. No matter how bad you think it is, it's going to be okay. Just listen. Listen. Instead of worshiping idols that can do nothing for us. And so just because we don't like something doesn't mean it's not good for us. I mean, and that's unfortunately the truth. And God promises us. He assures us. But we want it our way. My question is to you, why don't we try it God's way for a change? Why don't we try it God's way? You know, you've done it your way. You're, 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 you know, you're, you're living your life. It ain't working out thus far, right? It's not the way you want it to be. Otherwise, you wouldn't be complaining about something that's going awry. So why don't you try it God's way? Let me tell you how you can do that. In John chapter 3, 16, chapter 3, verse 16, God said this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He gave us the way. The way is through his son Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in chapter 14 verse 6, yes, you're going to get a gospel message right now. But he said in chapter 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one shall come to the Father except by me. Guys, we just read through six chapters of Jeremiah where the the, the chosen people of God were defiant, not listening, trying to do things in their own strength. And we see the results of, of trying to do things in our own strength. And God is saying, give it up. Turn from your wicked ways and call upon the name of Jesus. He says, if we confess with our mouth, he is faithful and just to forgive us. If we confess with our mouth, what? That Jesus lived, died, and rose again, what? We'll be saved. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of those sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Step out of the darkness and into the light. Last last point, because I want to invite you to come down and, and, and profess publicly that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. 21 years ago today, and quite a bit longer before that, in 1945, we landed on Iwo Jima, and the world which was dark was moved back into the light. And on February 23rd, 1999, the Lord saw fit to pull me out of the pit, out of darkness and into the light. And here's the most important part about that. I was almost 38 years old, but here's the most important part. And this is your charge. I had people in my life faithful to share the word of God with me. No matter how bad I got, they never wavered. No matter how bad somebody is in your life, no matter how much you can't stand what they're doing, no matter how you can't understand and you don't want to be around it, I had friends running with me in places they would never go just so that they could continue to share God's word with me. And on that wonderful, glorious day, February 23rd, 1999, I got up off the floor of my apartment, I opened up the door, and I invited Jesus Christ into my heart. I said, I surrender all of me to all of you. Lenny's zone does not exist anymore. It is only the Christ in me who exists. 
I'm not perfect. I still make mistakes, but he has promised to move me from point A to point B, and I trust in that. And you need to trust in that as well. Stand with me as we pray. Father, we love you. God, we praise your glorious name, and thank you for our time this morning. Lord, I pray that if there was one person who heard this message from you, uh, and they did not know you before, that today might be the day that they turn, that they step from darkness into light, and only through the cause and sacrifice of your son Jesus Christ. Call upon his name, and you will be saved. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth what a glorious day that is. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue.